This week on the Finding Free Thought podcast, we are pleased to bring you an interview with Pamela Garfield Yeager. She is a licensed clinical social worker, an awesome woman. Let me hit you with her bio. Pamela received her master's in social work in 1999 at New York University. She has been licensed in California since 2005. Pamela has experience working in schools in New York City, San Francisco, and Silicon Valley, California. She has been a clinical supervisor for over 10 years, overseeing therapists working in school-based programs and in mental health settings. She has worked in residential and outpatient programs for adults and teens who are severely mentally ill. After losing her job at Sutter Health in 2021 due to vaccine mandates, Pamela has been building a curriculum to guide parents through the mental health system. Her goal is to provide parents with the information and language they need so they can best advocate for their child's mental health. Pamela's mission is to educate parents on how to avoid therapists who lack skill or try to indoctrinate their children children. We had a great time chatting with Pamela. She really is deeply experienced in her field. She understands what is going on. Firstly, with the damage, the wildly illegal and immoral COVID response uh, did to children. And she has lots of work in that area, but also guiding parents through the labyrinth that is the gender craze right now and really, really supporting them. She has a great website full of resources. It is thetruthfultherapist.org. She just recently launched a whole bunch of things there. She's got a parent's guide to mental health. She has a course that you can do. She was recently featured in Disconnected. You can check out the trailer on her website. There's lots of feedback from uh, clients. She has uh, a community of her own you can join. I know she just launched a Substack. Uh, it really is a wealth of resources at a time when I think you know parents and kids are really struggling. So check out her website and grab all the amazing things that she has to offer. And if you know any parents that are struggling with the gender craze right now, she is a really, really great place to send them. So check out our website, thetruthfultherapist.org, and enjoy this conversation. We really had a great time getting into you know the comparisons between California and Canada, because frankly, Canada is really extreme, and California is just equal, equally extreme. Um, so enjoy the conversation, support her work, check her out on Instagram and Twitter, She always has lots of insight because she just sees through all of this uh, very, very professionally and with a great deal of wisdom. We hope you enjoy this interview with Pamela Garfield Yeager. As always, you can support the show and help us keep it all alive by going to our free thought shop purchasing swag you can purchase essential oils if you go to amanda's website msha.ke slash amanda o'donovan she has essential oils packages all laid out there to get you started on your essential oils journey we really advocate essential oils because they have been a huge boost in health freedom just because of how much specificity they give you in terms of treating the body nurturing the body uh it's really powerful working with the essence of plants to be honest this is ancient medicine and it has been distilled into a really incredible science so check out the essential oils offerings that amanda has at my site simonesser.com you can see all of my work you can connect to my new series super organism it's a deep dive into the occulted war on the family and the family as a super organism. And this is really a big response to the gender warfare, especially in the ways that it's altering biology, children's biology, and in the ways that it's replacing women and ignoring the actual power of feminine biology. Uh, This is a really important aspect of what's going on right now. And so reconnecting to the biology of the family, I think is a big part of fighting back. So check out superorganism at dauntlessdialogue.com. There's also all my comedy at Rise TV, my series Worlds Within. You can make donations and you can purchase free thought shop swag. You can do lots of things to support at my website. I have a whole page of it. Check it out. You can even make a crypto donation. Totally into that. Do it. Thank you for supporting the show. Thank you for tuning in. Enjoy this episode with Pamela Garfield Yeager. Boom. 
All right. Welcome to the Finding Free Thought podcast. We are so glad to have you join us. Today, we have a really exciting guest. We have uh, Pamela Garfield Yeager with us. Uh, she is also known as the Truthful Therapist, and we're really, really excited to chat with her about uh, all the, the issues facing kids and families right now with gender ideology and that, that entire sort of war that's unfolding. So uh, welcome to the show. Uh, Pamela, we're so, so happy to have you here. Let's, welcome. let's dive in. Thank yeah. you. Thank you so much for having me. <laughs> yeah, it's an honor. Truly glad. Um, so we are we're here in Canada sort of facing, I, I would say, some of the more extreme laws and changes that have occurred. But you're currently yeah. in California and you guys are trailing right behind all the Canadian laws and changes. What, what have been some of the more uh, recent changes that have unfolded there? Uh, if we could just start. start with that. Well, there was a new law that was just passed. I know a lot of people that now I've, I have finally met in person, but I've been watching fighting it is SB 107 here in California. And that's they're calling it now California, a, a trans sanctuary state for children. I should look up exactly what age it is, but I know it includes minors where kids from out of state from the United States can come to California to get basically gender medicine without parental consent. And they'll become a ward of California state now, which those of us are awake to it. Not only are recognize that this is a problem for the, those kids that might have regret or make mistakes in making decisions at such a young age, but we're also seeing this as a child trafficking freeway for some kids who are going to yeah. come here without their families or support. So they're much more vulnerable for those sorts of things. So scary stuff here in California. So that one is pretty bad. Oh yeah. The trafficking issue. That's a really, I hadn't actually thought about that yet. And I'm sure that the child traffickers are just drooling over that law. Yeah. It things right up for them. It it, ha it is. And uh, honestly, I'm, I don't want to speak too much. I'm not a, I haven't really done the deep dive all of it. I've just been spending some time with other people who have, who are really big advocates for children on that topic. And one thing, one of the advocates told me, uh, the woman who's in charge of mom army who I'm involved with, she, I got, this is where I, the source, she told me that trans kids apparently are more profitable, that they can trade more money for the trans children than children who are not trans. So I haven't read that myself, so I can't, say that for a fact, but that's, that's what I've heard. And I do I believe try. it. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So then let's take it back. Here, you, <laughs> but anyway, you know, that, it's dark. Yeah. I mean, uh, I think it, this whole subject is really going to get into a lot of darkness. It just sort of, it has to be confronted. Um, but I'm curious because you're, have you always been in California practicing or uh, did you end up there? Like uh, has your practice always resided there? Um, I've, I've been living in California since 2003, and so I've been here a while. Uh, but my before that, I was living in New York City and practicing there. I got my master's and my tra my original training in New York City at New York University. So I was working there in inner cities in Manhattan, in the Bronx, and Brooklyn, doing that sort of work, more social work kind of work. I was doing home visits and um, helping kids in inner city schools, that sort of thing. And I was working with a nonprofit community-based organization with low-income families who had, that this was the late 90s, early 2000s. It was focused on HIV and AIDS and just terminal illness. And now I think they're doing more foster care work. So I was working at an agency like that in New York. And then I moved here to California in 2003. I was actually a bartender for a short time to take a yeah. break. And then, and then I got back into it, working with foster youth, working in group homes. It was how I got back into it here in California in around 2005 and got my license here in California in 2005 and been working ever since in different settings here in California. Okay. And you seem to be, you know, part of a, a relatively, I mean, maybe I'm wrong about this, but a small group of therapists speaking out, you'd think there'd be more so I'm really curious, uh, like, have you had any colleagues reach out quietly in support? Uh, have you had a lot of pushback from professionals in the field? Like, what has been your experience as a professional who's put yourself out there on this topic? So I'm in a unique situation. The, I think the reason that my eyes maybe were open more and why it was easier for me to speak out is because 
I actually was went on disability at the end of 2016, and I actually got cut out of my profession, not not for any reason of my own, but because of medical reasons, I had to leave. So I, I kind of got cut off from a lot of my colleagues that for that reason. And I was really bedridden, honestly, for a few years and not really involved in any of any of these culture wars or any of anything public. I wasn't really following the news. I was I was lucky I could go out on walks with my dogs and just like just get to the doctor. And that was I was just sort of existing day by day. So I did I lose a lot of connections just just because of that. Um, I worked briefly during that time as a clinical supervisor, and I'm still in touch with a few people there. And I, I'm in touch with three people who are secretly agreeing with me, but are quiet, on the quiet front on this topic. But my other colleagues who I di- I was keeping in touch with have already kind of canceled me because I spoke out against BLM and some of the race issues. And also I wasn't, I didn't, I didn't get the, the thing for the virus. And mm-hmm. some people didn't want to see me from that. So there was all different reasons why a lot of my previous social work friends stopped talking to me. Um, the the gender thing came actually after that. And so I don't even know what they think if they're watching me do this or not. I don't know. I haven't been in touch with a lot of people. I've honestly been canceled by so many people in my life for all these different reasons that the powers that be have done to divide us, which is really sad. So um, I think it's easier for me to speak out because I, I have this situation where I already lost so much because of my physical thing. So that, I think that's why it's easier. For me to speak out, but um, I think some are some are just believing it or they're not thinking about it. I think a lot just aren't thinking about it. I would love to actually try to reach out to some people now and see what they think because it, things have changed a lot in the last year. It's gotten more extreme, and I'm wondering if more eyes have been opened. I'm honestly not sure. Yeah, it's kind of the the sad. It's like sad, but also beneficial that the extremism it's very harmful, but it's what tends to wake more people up. Yeah. Like when it gets put out there, some people, they need it. They need to see the extremism to recognize the real danger that's going on, that it's not just about, uh, you know, protecting people in the LGBTQ community, you know, that sort of generic yeah. fear that they put over all of it. I mean, um, I, I got to be honest, what's surprising people don't know about me is I was one of those people. So I know what it's like to be naive. I was the exact same way. I thought it was real. I, I still do support trans people. I, I thought it was about tolerance. I really, I thought, I thought these rainbows were nice. <laughs> I didn't think they were so bad. I didn't see the dark side of it. I was pretty naive. Um, I, well, I, the last time I was really working with kids, it was the end of 2015 and I was working in a high school in Palo Alto and we were even running a group for kids for LGBT. And I was the supervisor. I, I was just overseeing it. And I didn't see any problems with it at the time. I thought it was nice. I thought it was good. I thought it was helping kids figure out who they are. That's how I saw it. Um, but of course that was before things got more extreme. And since then my eyes have been opened. So it's been a shock to me too, honestly, I've, I've always aligned with that stuff before I'm a social worker. <laughs> yeah. So, I mean, you had this yeah, similar experience, similar. right? I was a social worker. And like I said, yeah, very similar. I was always in it. I always thought it was about affirming someone how they feel and yeah can't we all be accepting and and even just you know the whole idea of a therapist affirming um who you are when you come in to see them without just you know critical thinking and questioning and going through like why do you feel this way and uh, you know all the thoughts around that like what is your you know even in your work has your sort of way that you've worked with kids changed in terms of like do you affirm now or have you affirmed before? And so I'm I'm not currently practicing. Part part of the reason why it's been easy for me to talk is because I got canceled because I because of my governor here in California, Gavin Newsom, took me out of my job. I was in healthcare. I was one of those healthcare workers that lost my job last year. Mm. So that's that's what happened. So I basically said, All right, you've just emboldened me to speak out because I no longer have something, I have less to lose. So I've been, I've been, my role has taken on is more of education. I've wanted to educate parents on what's going on and how some of this stuff looks good, but can be harmful and how to find therapists that are not going to affirm. Yeah, so, that was a question also, like, you know, I know here in Canada, similarly, it's if, you know, if your kid really feels like they want this, 
there's nothing that the parent can do at a certain point. Um, you know, where the teachers and the schools and the legal system can somehow have more control than the parents and the parents yeah. know what is occurring. Um, so what can parents do like to find a therapist that may not affirm? Because a lot of these kids too might have just other mental health issues. They and usually so, do. Right. So if you're like, my kid has yeah. this issue, are they going to go into a therapist and then come out with a gender issue? Like, so oftentimes now, yes, unfortunately right. that's happening. So th there are some networks, um, maybe after I'll give you some of the links so you can yeah. tag them to the show. I have them on my website and on my Instagram on, there's a, several different organizations that have lists of therapists that will not affirm. Some of them are out publicly. Some of them are more a kind of an underground network of therapists. So there's a group of parents, they're called, um, parents of ROGD kids, I think is the name of the website, but I will, I'll send it out later. They all have a list of underground therapists that they work with that won't do the affirming thing. So yeah, I, that's what that stuff came out or when, I, while I was out or I was building while, right when I was coming back from my disability. And that was part of my wake up, this whole affirming thing, because I thought, yeah, it's, it's nice to uh, help a child figure out who they are and to help them find acceptance, but not just affirm everything they say, no matter what, that that's when it went too far for me. So I, I was like, what, what therapy is about exploring things and figuring things out and their children and even adults. I mean, if you're in therapy, it means you don't, you haven't figured it out yet. We're, we're here to figure it out together. So mm -hmm. that was one of my wake ups was, it was strange to me to keep hearing that word over and over again. Like therapy is affirmation, affirmation is not therapy. Yeah. Um, the documentary I was just in, I have a line that it, that's now being quoted. It basically saying, I can get affirmation from my dog, not from a human being. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So. Oh, and uh, tell us a little more about that. Cause I haven't seen the doc yet, but it did, it just got released, right? Yeah. It got released on October 8th. And it's what's called, it called again? It's called disconnected with a Y kind of a play on the words dis disconnected and dysphoria. Mm -hmm. And um, it's a really interesting documentary. And honestly, even I'm in it, but I learned a lot from it because I'm obviously not the only one talking in it. <laughs> and um, it opened my eyes to a lot of more philosophical issues. These are things, honestly, before, like I was just saying earlier, was naive to about just all the philosophical issues about separating your your body from your mind and and how society is is doing that more and more with social media and I guess meta is coming out and um, they talk about robotics and how they're they you can just kind of put your soul into another thing and the, this whole yeah. you're in a you're in humanism yeah that <laughs> that stuff I, I I never got that deep with it I was just kind of like this isn't therapy and I don't understand what's going on <laughs> Um, yeah. so it, it goes deep. Um, it, it does bring in some faith, which I think some people will really connect with other people might not. So it depends on, on your orientation. So it does bring up some of that, but it, it has some great points. There's a plastic surgeon in there. He's so blunt and upfront about how this is all ridiculous and how he can't believe that his colleagues are embracing this, but he says, yeah, of course it, it benefits their cash register. So it doesn't benefit their patient. So he, he says that quite bluntly. Um, and there's a detransitioner in it. That's her story is really inspiring. Her name is Daisy. And I got to meet her last weekend because we had a premiere and she's wonderful in the film. And you see footage of her from when she was young, when she did her own YouTube and talked about her transition and probably young people were watching her thinking this is wonderful. And then a few years later, she talks about, well, here's the deal. I'm detransitioning. It's really shocking the way it's the way it's put together. Um, but it has a really hopeful ending, which I don't want to give away, but uh, it made me cry. <laughs> so I think it's really well done. That's great. Yeah, yeah. I definitely would like to see it. And yeah. I think that the transhumanism element of some of all of this is something that's really interested in me because there is this increasing disassociation between, you know, who we are and our body. And this is something I think is being driven into kids over and over again. Yeah. And so disconcerting because it's already difficult enough just to develop an identity. Like we all struggle. It takes all of us decades to really figure yeah. out who we are, right? Mm -hmm. uh, it's a really tricky thing. Um, and you know, when I when I first found your work, it was a, actually a clip 
where you were talking about um, the power, giving the power to children to basically call everyone transphobes and what yeah. that, is, right? And I mean, that's that we can see that everywhere, right? This is something that's also happening with like um, BLM and all that, right? And teaching like young black kids that they can call any adult racist, you know, at the drop of a hat with all these, it's the same mm-hmm. thing, right? So it is, it's all connected, I think. Yeah, absolutely. I think there is an ideological sort of uh, warfare operation that is united. It seems pretty obvious to me. Uh, but I'm curious, like, if we could go deeper into that, like this this idea of giving children the power to undermine adults in that way. Like, what what have you seen in regards to that? And like, what I don't know. What can parents and what can adults do to sort of work with that issue that's now getting greater the more these kids are indoctrinated? Yeah, so I think there's this cultural shift that's happening that came under my nose. I think it's been happening for years and years, I guess, since the 60s and 70s, quite frankly, but I wasn't aware of it, where kids are getting more and more of what they want, right? They want kids, adults are saying, we want you to be happy. We want you to feel good. We want you to feel good about yourself at every moment, at every time. And and, um, sometimes that's okay, but I think it's coming at a cost. And now it's getting to this, I think it's crossed over this line. Maybe for some, it's crossed over a long time ago. It depends on who you are and what your cultural background is. But to me, it's crossed over this line to this extreme level where now kids can say and do whatever they want and adults kind of bow to them. And instead of that helping the kids and making them feel better, I've noticed I've noticed that the kids actually feel more anxious. They're floundering more. They need adults to kind of hold, have a container for them, to set boundaries for them, to say no at times when it's something that's not good for them or something not not good in general. And that's not happening. So the kids are flailing. They're all over the place and they're more anxious. And I think it's creating more mental health issues, actually. Mm -hmm. So it feels good in the short term. You know, it's like the short term gain. You're like, oh, here's some sugar. You'll feel good and you'll be happy. And then in the long term, the kids have a stomach ache, metaphorically. That's kind of how yeah. I see it. Where did they go in the end? Like to social media, to their teacher, yeah. to, I don't know, what, to peer support? Like where are they going for their... For that container now. Yeah. But yeah, they're not getting it. I mean, that's part of the problem. And I think that's why we're seeing such huge rises in anxiety. I mean, there's so honestly so many different elements to that, but that's just one of them. Yeah. So when I was working last year at the hospital, it was, it was a outpatient program. That was one of my things that was driving me nuts. I would see these kids that were obviously, they were, they were struggling. They had issues. Some of them had trauma in their past, or they just, they had their own issues and they were actually, and I saw them as sort of testing the adults. That's what kids do, especially when they have behavior issues, they're testing adults. And I saw this happen. And instead of the, the adults kind of saying like, well, let's talk about what's really going on for you. And this looks like you're really hurting or whatever the thing is, they would just say, oh, I'm not a, I'm not a transphobe. I'll make sure I can do the right pronoun. And they don't address what's really going on. And I would see the kids suffer more. That was hard for me to watch. I remember coming home and just sort of bitching at my husband about it. Like what the hell is going on? What happened to my profession? So yeah, it's interesting, actually. I think a lot of this was crystallized. There was, a, I don't know if you saw this, but there was a recent video leaked from, uh, a, it was a WPATH meeting. And it was basically them reconciling the fact that there are kids coming to harm. And something that one of the, the leaders of that organization said was, uh, you know, we want the kids to be happier in the moment, right? Like, it's about happiness in the moment, but I guess some of them are having reproductive regrets. And really yeah. trying to, oh, pull back. whoopsies, can never have children or can never breastfeed or whatever that ends up being for that child. And it, it does seem like, you know, he actually, it, it came out of his mouth that it was just about happiness in the moment with no thought about yeah. the implications. And I think that's scary too, because you have adults in organizations like WPATH who have the mindset of a child who yeah. are, you know, they're like candy in the moment kind of thinking. Mm-hmm. Um, Do you feel that there was like um, a purposeful infiltration of your field Uh, or or is this more just like a slow moving ideological movement? I mean, how how has it happened that so many well-educated professionals, many of whom are are parents themselves, 
have submitted to this. Yeah. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm curious as to how that occurred in such a large scale. I mean, I haven't done a research paper on it, but I have theories. Um, yeah. I, I think, it, I mean, I think it's coming from top down. So there, there's a lot of censoring for one. I think when this was happening several years ago, if you read like Abigail Shar's book, she talks about people who were canceled years ago who were speaking out on it in academia and other settings and other therapists, and they were just canceled in silence so that this, this narrative prevailed. And then I think there's a group think that started to happen among people. Um, but I think it's being run by the activists. I think there's a lot of money behind this stuff. Um, my, I'm a social worker. So NASW, I believe is pretty captured financially and ideologically by the activists. So it's coming from them. Um, I think there are other people that agree with me, but have been silenced or weeded out. I mean, I just got weeded out for not following a mandate. So now I'm not there talking to them to be able to change minds or, you know, have a, a real connection with them. So there's this weeding out process that's happened. And then also, I think that's just the temperament of counselors, social workers, teachers too, I think go in this category where my profession tends to attract a lot of people who are very nice and agreeable and want people to feel good. And I think that um, we, I think we do know better, but when this group thing comes down on us, we're not, people aren't really thinking. So I, I think it's, a, I think it's a, a bunch of things. Um, yeah, I think thinking freely about this issue is a big challenge for a lot of people, especially because you're right, like the the cancel culture has been going on for a long time. I recently found out that there's actually quite a history to um, people being canceled for speaking out against Lupron like years ago. Oh, really? Uh, I, I didn't even know that. I just found this out today that there have been um, patients suffering from Lupron issues and doctors trying to speak out against Lupron before this was all popularized. Uh, and so it, it seems like they have been working on this for quite a while. There was uh, some other stuff I found. Do you know anything about uh, precocious puberty and the way that this was framed? Yeah, I've I've heard that. That's sort of the argument. Um, yeah, yes. I mean, these are all new things I'm learning because I'm just a, I was just a regular teen therapist. I wasn't a, a specialist in all this stuff. But, you know, now that I'm kind of in, in the, the conversation about it, I'm learning. But, yeah, I guess they're using that as they use these exceptions as as ways to push their ideology, their, their agendas. So I think, yeah, they're using, I guess kids have this precocious puberty where they get puberty too early. So they use Lupron to suppress their puberty. And I, I don't know, I guess it helps some kids, but it's still, I know that drug is really ugly and it's given a lot of side effects, even for people that might not even be using it for um, gender confusion. Right. So what, tell me what you know about it. I honestly don't know that much. I just know that they're using these exceptions to push these things. Well, this is another one where when you look into it, it seems like there was kind of a long-term plan unfolding because um, I don't know if you know Corey's Digs, but um, it's mm -hmm. a researcher. It's pretty. It's a pretty thorough series. It's like a seven-part article series. And basically, uh, he brings up how precocious puberty itself seems to be kind of a made-up thing. That oh, it is? Well, in that <laughs> See, I don't even know. <laughs> the worst thing that could happen to some of these kids they're claiming who have precocious puberty was like they could be short or they might go puberty so early that there's some social ostracization, so social ostracization because their peers aren't going through it yet. Okay. And those are the two main things they're saying to parents being like, now, if your child goes through this, it could be short and their friends could make fun of them. So we should put them on Lupra. And like right. that's a lot of the precocious puberty diagnoses that were going on. And so it seems to me, especially from the, the detailed research in this series, I can link that to the episode as well, um, that there was a, a long term understanding of how to get these puberty blockers just into the medical industry in the first place to get them normalized. And now, I mean, because you look at the um, I'm pretty sure that it's not it's not approved by the FDA yet for for gender dysphoria. As far as I know, the puberty blockers are being given. No, it's some experimental, right? right? It's not been approved, uh, is my understanding. There's no approval. Yeah. It was only approved for, I believe, precocious puberty, which okay. in itself is shaky grounding. But regardless of that, it's being given now to, to these kids. And so it's interesting because I see some people say, oh, well, they, these drugs have a long history 
of being used. That's what is often being referred to as the whole precocious puberty narrative. So uh, I think yeah, there is, so, you know? So, no, I was just saying, I, I, a lot of people are speaking out who've used it for other things and are saying just how terrible that drug is. Adults, women who've had endometriosis and other things, just how terrible it, it, they, they experienced it. So the fact that they're acting like it's benign is, is wild. So uh, you have sort of found yourself in the midst of this with a lot of other groups and organizations starting to rise up and speak out, like uh, Gays Against Groomers, for example. Mm -hmm. They're really becoming like a large voice in this debate. Yeah, uh, they're amazing. <laughs> really great. Uh, you know, I've been connecting more with them and their work, and I think they're a really important voice. And I think one of the things they seem to blow up is this idea that uh, this is a left wing versus right wing issue, or this is straight conservatives versus the LGBTQ yeah, community. Not at all. Um, right. So what has been your experience in terms of that fake narrative? Because that's what the news keeps presenting it as. But what, what have you experienced in terms of those those false dichotomies? Actually, it's kind of hilarious because I was, I'd say, more left wing in the past. And in the last few years, I've I think I've moved further away from that. And because I've I've done some my own research and learned some things. And now I'm I've gotten in the mix of this gender discussion. So I'm I'm now I'm back hanging out more with the left wing people because they're the ones that are being impacted. And it's actually been a little hard and frustrating because they're still voting for the people who, who are passing these bills that are hurting the children with these <laughs> gender ideology, like the one I just mentioned earlier here in California. They're like, well, I'm still a Democrat, but I'm against this. And I'm actually frustrated with that because it's like, well, why are you a Democrat? Why are you voting for the people that are pushing this? But but the truth is that they are. There are mo more Democrats or more people who are, I'd say, either independent or on the left actually are the ones being impacted by this and are waking up to the fact that this is a problem. According to Abigail Shire, I think it's 80 percent of families are on the left that are being impacted by this and parents who don't. A believe that their kids are true trans, however you want to call it, that they don't, they don't, they see their child, they're had regular gender identity in the past and then shifted and they don't, they think they see that there's some other issue there. And, and most of them are people in more left-leaning areas and left-leaning families. So it's, it is kind of interesting. Um, yeah. Gays against groomers, they're, they're a mixed, they're a mixed bunch. Um, it's funny, they just, we wanted, when we were at the rally, like we wanted to keep away from the other, the counter protesters because there was their community. They wanted to talk to them. And I think they had a good reason to. They're like, this is our community. We want to have a conversation with them. They're not other people. They're, they're, we were one of them. We are one of them. So yeah. they, they wanted to talk to the people holding the pink and blue flags and the people saying that we listen to kids and, you know, trans kids need to be saved and all that. So um, it, it is it is interesting. A, a bunch of people from all different backgrounds are coming together on this, honestly. They all have different approaches, but I think none of them are wrong. I think it's just, I think it's great. We have different people with all different ideology that are working yeah. together. It's actually really kind of beautiful the way that's unfolded. It's probably healing a lot of the divides that have been kind of rampant in all these different narratives for quite a long time. Um, yeah, I think, you know, uh, you had a post uh, recently and it was about the flags, oh, <laughs> just yeah. the impact of the flags on the kids. I kind of want to talk about that because we have two young kids and, you know, we're in Toronto. So it's it's like one of the largest pride cities in the world. We have this the pride events here are massive and it gets really, all really intense. Long. It's all yeah. summer long. Like it's not just like pride week or pride month. It's like, yeah, you know, it's, it's like that here too in California, but maybe worse there. I don't know. Well, so for us, like our kids, you know, at no point does this stuff come up because they're not interested in it. So to them, it's just rainbows everywhere. And right. I mean, of course kids love rainbows. <laughs> Oh, and another one. <laughs> There's rainbows and unicorns and mermaids. It's all the fun stuff. They take all the cute fun stuff. It but, seems to be a theme. Yeah. So what what do you think is going on? Like, are they really, I guess they're they're really targeting kids in some of the, the ways that they design this propaganda. Um, For sure. And, you know, how can we push back against that? I, you know, I think there's oh. maybe some culture that we can create, but w what are your thoughts on helping kids 
digest all this propaganda that's so designed for their minds. You know, it's funny. I just want to tell you a story. When I was at the rally, I was standing with Daisy, the detransitioner, and Kat, Kat Kattinson, the both two detransitioners. And we were standing there and we were kind of still and quiet. We had, we we're all wearing purple and we were kind of calm and still. And then the, the LGBT group, they were waving all kinds of flags and they were playing all this fun music and they were dancing and they were, they were, look, they were honestly, they looked like they were more fun. And we were talking about that. We were like, you know, if I were a kid, I'd want to be in that area too. And we were, we were talking about that. And then the two day transitioners said that exact thing. They were like, yeah, that's what attracted me. They were more fun. They brought me in. They said I was, I, I count and I'm included and there, it was exciting and fun. And it, it was, I think one of them even used the word intoxicating about just how, just how powerful that was. And so I think we underestimate how powerful these, just the colors and the music and the the messaging is these, all these affirmations, they, they feel good when, especially when you're feeling lousy, but even if you're just a regular kid, like this is fun stuff. Like I was sitting there thinking that myself, like they look more fun over there. They got less fun once they came over and harassed one of our speakers who was talking about her own daughter who died by suicide and started yelling and interrupting her, then they were less fun and they show their true colors. But until they do, they seem fun. So, yeah, so, I don't know. What can we do? Uh, it's, it's a big, we're fighting against this so much propaganda. We're fighting against so much this force, right? That it's coming from at all ends. It's unbelievable how many ends it comes at them. So I, I, what can we do? I mean, talk to them, I guess. It's, it's, we need to talk to them. We need to tell them that just because things are pretty and rainbows, like there's more to it. And, and also teach them if they are feeling uncomfortable, it's okay not to go along with things. If they're being told to do pronouns and they feel weird about it, they don't have to do it. It doesn't, you don't have to do things just to be nice. Kids want to be nice. I mean, there's all, how many t-shirts out there that say be nice to so be kind, right? So that's what kids want to do. Every kid wants to be nice. So I guess finding that balance of figuring out when are the times where it's okay not to do things, just, just to be nice. So there's a lot of pushback against the detransitioners, which I, I mean, I'm sort of shocked, but not shocked because of how extreme all this has been, but there seems to be, you know, these coordinated attacks on de- like, I know Chloe Cole has dealt with a lot yeah. of pushback. There's been like hit pieces written on her. Um, so, you know, and you said you you got to actually connect with some of them. I guess they're experiencing that pushback as well, right? Like, oh, they yeah, big time. they're being accused of what? Like, what is the angle that is being used against people with these detransition stories? Well, basically, when they come, I mean, we know what the underlying thing is, that they're telling the truth and people don't like it. But from their, from their angle, it, you're hurting people who would be trans that need this what they believe is life-saving care. So it's similar to the, I don't want to get you kicked off, the thing, because when when a person who was injured by the thing would talk about it, they would say, no, don't talk about it because you're going to discourage people who need it because most people will benefit from this thing. You're the exception. Despite the fact that the left likes to say they care about minorities, when there's a minority that goes against their collective narrative, they don't like that minority anymore. So, (laughs) (laughs) right, think about that. Um, so I think, yeah, their, their, their view is one, they're, they're breaking someone's worldview and it's, it's painful and hard. And, and so they'll, this kind of spew venom at that. And then I think the earnest way of looking at it is the, we really need the people who, who will be, their lives will be saved by this to not be discouraged. So if you talk about your story, you're going to discourage someone from getting what they need. I think, I think that's the earnest way of looking at it. And we know that's not true, but yes, the threat of of co- the constant threat of suicide is a pretty big manipulation. Mm-hmm. Um, are are you aware of like what what stats they're citing? Like, what are they citing when they claim that all these kids are on the verge of suicide? Is the what, what, there's nothing I should to go be- back and look now, but yeah, and all of it's been redacted. It's been none of it makes sense. Uh, the I actually talked to this one parent who said. She had an eight-year-old child who um, identified as trans and she brought this child to the gender clinic and they did that exact thing. If you don't affirm your child, and they did affirm the child actually, but they were still saying, if you don't affirm your child, your child will will go kill themselves. And so 
they they actually reached out to me and felt uncomfortable with that threat. And I said, why don't you ask them for the study? Just ask them what, what, to show you. And they took them several weeks to get back to them. When they finally did, I wish I knew the name of it. They said the study that they showed them just taught, had questions that asked the kids if they had ever thought about suicide ever. And it didn't say anything about any suicide attempts or actual follow through with suicide at all. So it, they just, just because someone has a suicidal thought is enough for them to say that now the kids are all going to kill themselves. And that's not true. So even just bringing up those things that might not even be happening, like how problematic is that to bring suicide into a conversation that it may not even be thought about? Like these kids might not be thinking about suicide. And they're putting these sort of... Exactly. It's giving them the idea, right? It's teach the, the kids have learned either through their own therapist or through our YouTube influencer or all these places. If they say, I'm going to go kill themselves, they get what they want. That is blackmail right there. Um, when we, when I, as a therapist, my entire career, I've always been taught and learned through dialectical behavioral therapy and other therapies that usually target people with personality disorders, but just people who have this behavior that threatening suicide is not the way to go. Usually what that does is in the end, push people away because they, it ends up, they end up recognizing it's an empty threat and then they get tired, right? They, you really can't make friends that way. You can't tell a boyfriend or girlfriend, you can't break up with me or I'll kill myself. Like that doesn't work out in the long run for a relationship, right? It's, it's very similar. So you teach people who have that, usually fears of abandonment or things like that, who do that, you teach them that there's other ways to get your needs met in more healthy ways, right? You ask them what you need. You, you say, I like, you know, I'd like to have dinner with you and spend time with you or share your feelings, or you learn how to self-validate. You learn how to sit with yourself and sit with your own feelings. You don't need someone else to do it for you all the time, but that's all being thrown out the window right now. And now they're just teaching kids to use this emotional blackmail It's completely against everything we've ever learned as therapists, how to teach, how to treat people who have these kind of tendencies. So yeah, that was a wild thing to me. I mean, honestly, even if they are suicidal, you still, I mean, if they are suicidal, then you treat them for the suicide. We're not going to treat them for the gender dysphoria. We're going to get them safe. Um, So it's just, yeah. And, and, And also the other truth is people who tend to gravitate towards this ideology I mean, now, honestly, it's becoming so widespread. It's such a big net, but usually it's someone who has some kind of depression or anxiety or somebody who might have suicidal thoughts because of other reasons in their life, right? So it makes sense. So they're using, they're weaponizing someone's mental health issues to, to get to match this agenda when really we should be treating what's, what's causing the suicidality. It's usually something else. And the gender thing is looked at as a quick fix and it's not, it does in the long run, it doesn't work out usually, I mean, for the most part, so. So there was the study that came out that was, you know, that really, really upset the the gender ideologues, which is the, the one that came out by Lisa Littman. Yeah. And she interviewed all those parents, right? And I think that that was another good example of the, uh, the percentage of parents that are more left-leaning, because I think even though mm-hmm. she had gathered it from sites that were openly sort of against all of this, it was something like 80% of the parents that she interviewed right. were they were pro uh, LGBTQ. They were supportive of it. And then the other thing that her study really found was that this is happening more to girls than it is to boys. And that seems to be the case. Now, the, the left came out very quickly. They suddenly had a study to rebuke all of this and said, no, 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 no. It's not it's not disproportionate to girls or boys. But I, I think that's been proven again and again. Has that been your experience now working more directly? Oh, yeah. Right? It's more girls for sure. Well, I mean, what I... When I, I know it's happening to boys too, but it just so happened at the program I was at that it was only girls and they were all non-binary at the time. So at the, the stage I was meeting them at, they were, they were acting or they were saying they were non-binary. They were all girls. There was not one boy. There were some boys who I guess would do more not gender non-conforming behaviors. Like they saw, I saw some boys wearing nail polish and things like that, but none of them claimed they were a girl. Only the only the girls did that. So yeah. 
And you were saying that you you had a, a plastic surgeon friend that you were speaking to about all of this. And this is something oh, he was that in I, the film. He was in. The, I just saw her. He's in that film, the disconnected film. So I didn't okay. actually talk to him myself. He's okay. got some right. great interviews and quotes in that film, disconnected. I, I highly recommend it just for him. He's he's an awesome. He's so blunt. I really love the way he speaks. He's like, what, is there something in the water? Did an asteroid come down and blow up the earth and change everybody's brain chemistry? Why would anybody <laughs> ask any questions? That's how he puts it. It's amazing. I, I well, like his temperament. <laughs> well, it's a big relief to hear that someone from that industry is speaking out because in my research, we were already doing this to girls before the the, the gender ideology you know, labiaplasty and breast augmentation was spiking in teenage girls. This was already on the rise. And so, you know, it seems like there was something about our culture that was already ushering young girls in this direction of, if you don't like your body, cut it up. Yeah. You know? I mean, it's been for years. I, there's this, there's this Netflix show, um, something about the nineties, like the dark side of the nineties. And there's one, there's one that talks about with Baywatch and how that influenced all these girls to get breast impl implants in the nineties. Right. So everybody wanted to be like Pamela Anderson. And I mean, now it's, it's kind of gone the opposite, but it's the same idea. Right. Um, it's been going on for years and years where people just don't feel comfortable in their bodies. And I think the more social media, I mean, they, we used to blame the magazines and the movies and the movie stars. And now we're blaming, I think then there was uh, reality TV, a lot of that reality TV stuff, like the Kardashians and like a lot of the fake stuff. And now the influencers, and I think the fact that kids are participating in their own kind of reality TV shows online, I think it's just making it all just compounding. So. Yeah. And that seems to have, I think what social media and smartphones did was they brought it to even younger kids. You know, yeah. with Baywatch and all that stuff, it was teenage girls, but now we have preteens and kids in middle school were being impacted by this. You said you were working with teenagers, right? I was, yeah. I was working with both adults and teens. So just so you know, not one transgender adult. And there were three times the amount of adults because we had a substance abuse program. A, a, uh, there were three different programs for adults and there was only one for teens. So I only I saw a third of the teens uh, ratio wise, but there were three out of 10 kids were transgender but not, not one adult. And that wasn't a thing with the adults at all. They they were concerned about their issues, their mental health issues and what was going on for them, where the kids were kind of obsessed with pronouns and other things and social justice issues. So yeah, so I was working with both, but I'm talking more about the teens because that's what was shocking me. Yeah. So, you know, there are some people I've, I've encountered this online, you know, people who are still supportive of this who have not really been exposed to some of the darker truths who just say that, you know, a lot of these kids are just coming out now because it's safe. We made right. the condition, right? And they were there all along suffering and they're finally free. So, you know, what do you have to say to that sort of argument that, you know, I see echoed all the time still, and it takes some time to pull people out of that notion. Yeah. I mean, I've been working with kids for so many years and I've been working in very safe and open environments for many years. I was working in Palo Alto, California in 2015 there was one child who was transgender in the entire school. Right. And a lot of those kids told us our, their secrets and it was very left-leaning and open at the time. There would have been more if, this, if there was more of a social influence. So there's, so I have that experience to be able to pull from. And then also, just like I said earlier, the adults versus the kids. If, the, if, everybody, if, if everybody could come out now, if everybody was so shamed before, and now all the transgender people could come out of the woodwork, you know, come out of their shells, then it would be pretty even across adults and kids, right? Wouldn't it? And it's not. Adults aren't coming out in droves like they are, like the kids are. So I'm seeing that proportion uh, being so disproportionate, that, that to me shows the kids are being targeted. The kids are getting these, this marketing campaign from all angles, whether it be Hollywood, their schools, therapy, doctors every you know coming from all these angles and the the parents aren't getting it i mean the adults aren't getting that kind of propaganda so yeah, yeah. that's why i think it's not yeah absolutely i think that there yeah. it's pretty obvious once you do a bit of research but again it's like you have some people who 
because of all the censorship, they just they've only been exposed even now to just the this is about supporting, this is about supporting, don't be transphobic, you know. And uh I think some of the some of the harder hitting voices in this space have been the trans people speaking out. Like, you know, you yeah. have like Buck Angel who's been speaking out actively about this. And I think, you know, there's really interesting nuances now coming about. I've learned a lot that uh, you know, he and, and and Blair White, I think as well, they talk about identifying as transsexual as opposed right. to transgender. So have you spoken with or, or explored any of that nuance now? Because I'm just sort of learning about that whole differentiation. I know I'm learning it too. Like, again, this is <laughs> stuff is new to me too. Um, I, I had an interview with Book Angel. It's on YouTube. So if anybody listening right. wants to look me up, you can find that. Um, it was great talking to him. And you notice I use the pronoun. I'm I'm fine with that for people who are transsexual and not pushing uh, speech, like being a speech police on me. I'm fine with that because we we acknowledge the truth and we have a social contract about it, and and I respect it. So I know people want to call me or people who like me transphobes, but that's really not the case. <laughs> I really do respect it for a certain few. And yeah, there is a difference because well, what I think what really pisses Buck and Blair off are these people who are, first of all, the non-binary. He's like, we're not the same because the whole point of becoming trans was to be the opposite sex, not to be some middle ground thing. What's the point of changing your whole body if you're going to shift your gender every other minute? Because that's what a lot of people are doing nowadays. Also, the people are identifying with non-human things like cats and wolves or whatever dragon self i don't know all these things that are that are ha- coming out i mean that those those things make a mockery of somebody like him who's had a real mental health issue who went through a real struggle went through years of therapy to make a decision that seems to be the right one for him and go through a lot physically apparently the testosterone uh, almost killed him at one point so it's it's not this isn't this isn't something to sneeze at and he recognizes and is truthful about the fact that this is not just some little light little thing like getting, I don't know, putting on a new wig or something like that. It's it's serious. So he doesn't he they they don't like it that they're I think that something that's really serious and really was really painful for them and difficult is kind of being made as a mockery and just being looked at as this light little thing connected with unicorns and mermaids, and it's not the same. Yeah, so, I think I've, I've learned it. I honestly, I've been learning a lot myself. Like I, I've never been, and I, I, I wouldn't call myself an expert on this stuff. I still, I'm not. I'd say the thing I have experience on is just working with teens and kids and mental health in general and family therapy, that sort of thing. That's where my expertise is. So that's why it was just hard for me to stay quiet when I, I know how kids are. I know, especially know how acting out kids are, kids that don't have proper families and foster care when they're grasping for straws, that this is just all, this is all stuff that's really easy to latch onto. So uh, that's what I have been seeing. That's been my perspective, but learning a lot from those guys. Mm. You know, uh, there was a, something that was re- released recently. Was that the makeup company that put on? Oh, yeah, Ulta. Ulta. Ulta Beauty. Yeah. That happened over the weekend. They, they sell, yeah. it's not a, it's like a, basically a store that sells all kinds of beauty pro- products. Right. And uh, they had uh, this guy, this man named Dylan, who claims he's a yes. girl and uh, people really pissed off about it. And they had, I didn't even, I see these things and I scroll past them because they make me so irritated. So I actually didn't even watch the video to see what he, how he, what he actually said, but he said something the effect of I'm a, I'm a woman because he mm-hmm. does that all the time. And it, he's Mark. He's they paid him as a, a representative of their company, so people are pissed. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> well, I was tracking the responses to that on Twitter, and it's like 90% women. And so, this is one thing I wanted to bring up is the idea of this taking over women's spaces, yeah, and the, the, the identity of womanhood. And, and the other element of it is that Dylan and that whole thing they're talking about girlhood. They're I know, grown- not even about- womanhood. Oh, these are grown men who are being presented as experts on girlhood. So, I mean, there's a lot to unpack there, but I'm, I'm curious, both of you, frankly, on your thoughts of like this idea of girlhood and womanhood being totally appropriated with what 
many, if you go through the comments on Twitter, like Alta is frantically trying to hide comments. You can actually go for everyone. If you go to their post on the pot with the podcast, you go to the bottom, right? There's a small button that says hidden comments and you can click it and go through all the comments they've hidden. But a lot of them are, you know, saying that this is basically like blackface for women. So, you know, but it's like, I don't know what 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 are your thoughts on on this on the appropriation of womanhood and what that means for you know feminism and the progress of women over decades like what do we have what are your thoughts and feelings on you want to answer first since I've been doing a lot of talking <laughs> oh, I have no idea I mean to me right away I'm just like isn't this a fetish like if there's a man yeah. I mean, like he thinks he's a girl young girl or he's trying to talk to young girls I don't I don't even understand he's I mean, just I, acting I think he's just he's playing a role like yeah. that it does come across yeah. that way. i mean again it th- i guess it's just the war on women and the family and it, to me i see it in a big scope it's like if you're constantly attacking women like i i grew up in the 90s 90s 2000s so it was always like yeah the magazines and it's like well don't look at that body acceptance body acceptance body acceptance mm-hmm. all of a sudden even you might not be okay with your body you might have to still cut it up whether you feel like a woman or a man inside and so to me, it just seems like it's beating down to attacking the family system, attacking women's reproductive, you know, abilities and, um, yeah. Have you seen any of Dylan's stuff? You should check it out just to, so you know, it's pretty, it's pretty over the top. It seemed, I thought for the longest time that Dylan was someone making fun of all of this. I thought it, 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 you can't tell if it's real or if it's satire, right? It's sometimes you can't even tell. It's so, yeah. it's so crazy. <laughs> but yeah. uh, my across. personal belief is I think Dylan doesn't believe he's a woman. I think Dylan is getting, re- getting very rich from doing this and getting a lot of attention from doing this. Likes attention is an act, a good actor, honestly. Um, if you take away all of the anger and all the things you just said, which are very valid, it's kind of funny what he's doing <laughs> that at times, honestly, but if, but it's not funny because it is infuriating at the same time. Um, I don't like using that term blackface for women only because, well, maybe I'd say Dylan or people like him who are, I think are playing a role. You could say it for, for him. But I don't like saying that for all trans men or trans women, whatever, because I think there are trans women who are not pulling this crap. So I still want to respect the very few trans women who are just trying to live and be blend in and not trying to overtake women's spaces and not trying to do all that. So that so I, I don't fully like using that term. It's also just a way to just get everyone pissed off, I think. But, mm. but I, I do, I see what their point is. And I, and it, he definitely is appropriating women. And he's, if he was just, if he was just living as a woman quietly, it wouldn't piss me off so much, but he's doing it and he's making tons of money. He did the thing with Forbes magazine. He was on a float for the pride for pride and like for TikTok. He's making tons of money off of all these sponsors. And so, yeah, it's, it's getting lots of reinforcement. Um, mm. In terms of feminism. so. I, since my little, I guess, red pill wake up, I've I've come to realize that I think feminism is not so hot all the time. I think it is. I think in a way, feminism has fed some of this stuff because feminism has taught girls that they could be just like boys and have sex like men, and families and babies are less important. And um, honestly, I fell into it a bit in my twenties, kind of live in the sex in the city kind of lifestyle in New York. And I think yeah. feminism kind of screwed me up a bit. And I think feminism is fed into some of this stuff to basically now, I think it's gone so far. The sex positivity movement has made a lot of girls and, and honestly porn. It's made a lot of girls want to opt out. you like, oh, I don't want to be a part of this. I don't want to be the woman that feminism is telling me I'm supposed to be, which is this, you know, sex positive person who, will do all these things and like whatever all these expectations of women have gone have gotten pretty wild and I think feminism honestly has played a role in that so it's this weird dichotomy where on one hand the feminists are 
rightfully so, very angry that women are being sort of replaced by men. But then also a lot of the feminist ideals have actually fed into this whole thing in the first place. So I don't, it's an interesting thing. So I don't like to put myself in the feminist category at all. I kind of like to opt out of it now. Um, I thought I was a feminist my whole life, you know, but yeah. I don't think I am anymore. So I know mom said to me the other day that she thinks she's been sensing some of the feminist brainwashing in herself where it's like I don't know if I want to have a kid because I might lose my career I might lose you know all the things that you know you thought men had that you wanted and sort of deconditioning from possibly being you know all of the feminism sinking in and you know making you career focused making you focused on money and power and you know, yeah. oh, I don't want to have kids, they're a drain. Oh, I don't want to have a family. That'll slow me down. <laughs> that kind of right. It, yeah, you, and you can't have it all. That's the reality. And I think feminism sells this lie that you can. And so you just can't. You, something's got to give. And I think some, I, I believe everybody can make their own choice. I don't, I don't think there's one right way to be a woman. But I do think that feminism has sold this lie that you don't need a kid or a family when I think some women really do want that, but they lie to themselves that they, that they don't. So, I mean, I, obviously you can't, I can't read people's minds. So it's going to be, everyone's different individually, but I do think that as a whole feminism has sold this, this idea that women can go sleep around like men and it's no big deal. And I mean, birth control has really allowed so you can go do whatever you want and it's just it's it's changed the landscape of things and it's changed I think how women see themselves and I think it's changed I think it's influenced girls to be scared of being a woman or being a girl or scared of when their bodies start changing what does this mean what do I have to do <laughs> and like so you know Chloe Cole talked to, talks about that a lot in her testimony about how she didn't want to be this object of sexualization. She didn't want to be the sexual being that all the media was presenting, you know, like the idea that feminism is Beyonce in a thong, yeah. on a page, right? And that's right. power, that's female power. And that she she openly says that that scared her away and made her feel like I, I must be a boy because I really don't want to be that. And I think that's really prominent for a lot of these young girls. Mm -hmm. And so it really brings up this idea of culture war that uh, it's about culture, about the culture being produced and the culture being consumed. And yeah. so, you know, I feel like a lot of us, if, if we're not producing culture that responds to this, we need to at least be helping to curate it. You know, for us, we're obviously pretty careful what media we allow our children to consume, but it is increasingly difficult. You know, you have Muppet Babies and Blues Clues and all these shows that are now everywhere. Yeah. It's all over the place. Right. And so it, it, it has become really difficult. And I guess if I give any advice to parents, it's like, number one, if you can homeschool your kids, homeschool your yeah. kids. Oh my God. Yes. Yeah, uh, definitely. Yeah. I heard Chloe say something in one of her testimonies. She said, I wasn't trying to be a boy. I was running away from being a girl. Yeah. And I think, and I think she might've said that. I don't know if she put it as we or I, but it was, that was basically the message that not comfortable being a girl because of the expectations. And she did disclose she has some sexual trauma in her history. So that, that also does have, uh, I think that happens to a lot of girls if, if they've been, if they have some kind of his, history of sexual assault or, um, or even just, it doesn't have to be even that serious, like just a, a, a sexual encounter that didn't, that really didn't feel right for them that could really turn them to never want to be a woman or girl again. I, I'm honestly, I could relate to that thinking back to my young life and trying to figure myself out and figure out who I was sexually. It's, it's not easy. Every young person goes through that. And I feel like all of this is exploiting those, those times that are hard. This is something else that came up in Abigail Schreier's book that when they did the research on all these girls transitioning, uh, very few of them want to, present as boys in the end they just want to be not girls yeah you know they don't because they don't end up like joining masculine groups and like going and working with tools and like getting no. into all these masculine things they don't go that direction they just get away from girlhood 
Uh, and so it's not even transitioning into do being a boy or being a man. It's something in between, it seems. It leaves them in this sort of no man's land <laughs> or no woman's yeah. land. <laughs> they call it, they like to say, like, Daisy has a quote in that movie I'm in. She says, I just thought I'd be this cute femboy. So that was her, that was her fantasy, that she would be this femboy. So she's not trying to be masculine. She was just trying to be something kind of cool and different and not herself. Um, mm. Yes. But about the boys, though, just to bring it up, I think the boys, the boys that do want uh, are attracted to this, they're a little older. But I think I think for them, a lot of them talk about being afraid of the responsibility that comes with being a man or boy that where they have to be the head of a household or be the income provider, I think. And then also a lot of boys are told that their masculinity is toxic. Right. So they're being being told all that those messages have an influence and then the other big influence is i think critical race theory so right now if you are a white male you are the most oppressor oppressor person you're the most evil on the planet so you tell a young boy white boy especially that he's a bad person just for existing just for how he was born that it makes sense that he might want to opt out of that because he doesn't want to be that bad person because he's internalized those messages and the schools and everywhere else they're teaching them that. So I think it's coming from so many different angles. Yeah, that's a really good point, actually. Yeah, true. The, that's a really true overlap between the CRT and the gender ideology right yeah. there. Absolutely, you can yeah. see that. And I know that there's been a lot of, uh, Billboard Chris talks about this, about how, uh, he overwhelmingly sees the black community speaking out against this and being really, really, really against transing children. And yeah. so it's like, again, you have the left, like ignoring voices from communities. They're normally like speaking up for all the time. And like the, yeah. the, the, the contradictions are just like rampant. And the, the the mental gymnastics someone must have to do to stay in this space long term. <laughs> I find it kind of startling. I don't even really understand how someone can pull that off, you know? I, yeah, I think a lot of them just don't think about it. So you and I, the three of us, we're all thinking about it. We're all looking into it. We're watching videos and we're putting our own thoughts. We're spending time thinking about it. They don't mm -hmm. think about it. They're told a thing and then they just go along with it and they don't stop and think. And that's what, that's really what I've noticed. And it's, and their feelings take over. This is good and this is bad. And then they feel it. And so that's enough. And they don't stop and think logically. And if you're able to get to their logic mind, you can break through it pretty quickly. But it's hard to once they've gotten pushed into it. So mm -hmm. that's what I think. If they're not thinking about it. Because, yeah, they're not do, you're talking about mental gymnastics. I think they're doing mental sits. <laughs> they're not doing anything <laughs> mental. They're like just sitting around, just right. listening to what they're told. Right. <laughs> they're just, yeah, they're sort of spinning <laughs> out. Losing muscle mass. <laughs> um, okay, well, I, I have one more thing I wanted to bring up before we wrap up, and it, it really has to do with like where this is going on the legal front. Because now you have Matt Walsh; he's going hard to get like laws put in place to yeah. stop, just to put a hard stop to transitioning children. Uh, and so, you know, there, I think there is a larger war that's about to explode on the legal front, at least in America right now in Canada, there's not enough pushback. The law, the yeah, unfortunately, but... right code has been rewritten since 2016. It's mm -hmm. really very far gone here. I hope that there's a turnaround, but so what are your thoughts on like the, the laws that need to change and like, where do you think things should go legally so that, you know, people who want to become trans adults are still supported in that, but that the kids are protected. Like, what what do you feel needs to be put into place? Well, I think the biggest thing that's happening le happening legally is that parental rights are really under assault overall. So here in California, there are several bills. I'm not sure what's been passed and what hasn't, but that to take away medical consent for parents for their children. So a lot of medical procedures now can be consented by children. They're, they're working on that hard here. I do know as a therapist, starting in 2011 here in California, that a 12-year-old can come to therapy without parental consent. That's been since 2011 here. Yeah. So it's probably been a long-term plan for a long time. Of course, at, at that time, I thought, well, isn't that nice? <laughs> because I'm nice. And that's how we naive people think. Um, yeah. 
but there I also to note there's another lawyer who has a firm specifically fighting trans laws. Her name is Candace Jackson. Um, and so there, there are other fighters out there in the legal arena. And there's also a, a, a legal firm called the Gavel Project, and they're fighting some of these trans laws. They're fighting also some of the other, some of the COVID restrictions and things that happened to kids last year with forced masking and whatnot. But there, there, are, there are several lawyers that are fighting this stuff. Um, but yeah, I think I think it has really has a lot to do with parental consent. Yeah, I think the more the laws they take they take away, the more they take away parental consent, where kids can go off and do what they want without the parents knowing or without the parents' consent, then that's going to make it harder and harder for for kids to because kids can't make their own decisions, and if the parents don't have any say, I think that's that's the scariest part of all of this. So. Yeah, it's true. The, the whole notion that children can consent is, I think, one of the biggest lies that's pushed here. And it's scary because it's really what pedophiles have been pushing this whole time, you know? Yep, there yeah. you go. <laughs> Happens yeah. to line up with that. Wow, crazy. Yeah. Um, you, anything else that you wanted to uh, to add before we wrap up? Um, is there any other, like, just from the rally, like, any other voices that you wanted to bring forth to share, like, any stories that you heard or, hmm. yeah, just okay. something that our listeners might just feel moved by um, getting access to a rally that we didn't, you know, wouldn't normally. Yeah, have. I know. I was like, bummer. Now it's not in the, right. But it, it was a great rally because we really did all come together. Um, there was a lot of fear, in the, especially in the beginning, that we they hired security because they were afraid that there was something bad was going to happen, but n nothing bad happened. Um, I mean, personally, I got to connect with a lot of people. Like I met Chloe in person who you're talking about. Um, I met this woman named Abigail Martinez. She's that mom who such a sad story where the, the California took her child away and her child ended up killing herself. Um, but watching, but I'll tell you the, the hopeful part was seeing everybody together. And it's watching everybody connect with each other. It, it, the rally did one thing where we were out there, we held signs, we were had a presence. But I, th to me, I think the, the the most accomplished piece of that rally, and I think there's going to be more of this to come, is having people come together and join forces and know that they're not alone, and that more and more people are joining this fight every single day. More and more people are waking up every single day. Um, I, people who are afraid to speak out or afraid of the reputations are no longer afraid. They're actually believing now this will help their reputations. So I, I think it's just wonderful to see that. And um, yeah, and people being celebrated, people being um, just being appreciated for, for having this bravery. This is, that's what real bravery is is to be one of the first to step out, like Chloe, especially. She she really, their cameras were on her the whole time. She had this bright smile on the whole time. I just wonder how she can handle all that attention. I can't handle that kind of attention, um, but but it's well-deserved, right? And just seeing, just seeing all these people who have been beaten down to get that kind of praise and accolation. And um, yeah, it's great. Unfortunately, though, I'll just tell you that the doctors, we, the, our goal was to talk to doctors and they were instructed not to talk to us. And they didn't. We had we had these handouts to give to them that had all kinds of information. A lot of things that we were just talking about today about the real stats on suicide and how these studies are not real and all, all kinds of information. It was really well done. We put together these big packets. They had 3000 of them and we weren't able to give out most of them because the people we were at this doctor's convention and they weren't, they weren't allowed to get, we weren't allowed to give them out. So we're going to actually give them out locally and, and throughout our communities. So it's not going to go to waste, but we weren't able to do that. So the censorship is real. The machine is pushing hard, but we are pushing back harder. That's the yeah. hopeful part. This is, well, this will not last. This is not sustainable. So. Well, and I think, you know, what the what the work you're doing and Gaze Against Groomers and like all these larger voices that are arising, I think it's a good message to people 
who might want to speak out because now there is a community yeah. to welcome you, to support you and to lift your voice up and to back you up from cancel culture. And, you know, that, that's yeah. a really good thing. So I think yes. people, you know, there's a good message there that people can be less afraid of speaking out now because there's support, you know. And the detransitioners have really formed their own community. Um, there's There's been others around that, but that they've been on their own. And I think now they're coming together a lot more. Chloe just started a new website. I think it's called Detransitioners United. Mm -hmm. And that's that's a really great resource for detransitioners. We know there's that big Reddit group, but I think there's, there's more things forming. And I think they're going to be the cool kids. They are the cool kids to me, but I think they're going to be the cool kids to more people out there. So... Absolutely. Yeah. I agree. They're totally heroic. And Chloe is a really inspiring human being. Her voice is just crystal clear. I really, really admire the way she speaks out. Yeah. Um, great. Well, so how can uh, how can people find you and support your work and, you know, help lift up uh, everything that you're doing? So I did write a parent's guide to mental health, which includes a lots of different topics, not just gender. Um, but I did write a pretty thorough like 12 page essay on all these different from coming from all these resources. And then a lot of my own thoughts as a clinician to give parents advice on how to talk to your child. If you are, if they are kind of falling into this trap, I don't know, cult, whatever, if they're falling into these ideas and they don't believe that their child is, is truly, you know, they don't believe it's genuine and they see, they see pretty obviously other other things going on so i give i give some actual questions and things you can do so i pu i put that on my website which is the truthfultherapist.org and then i also have a thing on other topics just on suicide prevention i have a whole thing on just how to screen for an appropriate therapist and what are some red flags in therapy for example if your therapist is making is inducing more anxiety in you and talking about climate change or talking about needing to mask when you're trying to work out your other issues, not a good therapist. <laughs> um, that Those are some obvious things, but I go into just, I'm just basically bringing out all of my experience as a clinical supervisor in schools with teens and so on, and to pass on to parents. So that's on the website. And then I have my Instagram, which I think maybe how you found me, which is the dot truthful therapist.org. That's where I'm most active on social media. And then I do have a Twitter, which is Red Pill the LCSW. So that's where you, those are the places you can find me most. Great, great. Well, we look look forward to to sharing your work, and uh, yeah, we'd we'd love to have you back on the podcast in the future. Thank you so much for having me. Yeah, that's yeah, we're you guys glad are so to... insightful. <laughs> no, it was really, really a, a great honor, and uh, yeah, let's keep fighting and, and saving kids. It's great to be together with other fighters and keep talking to them. It just makes us all stronger. Yes. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. All right. well, thank you so much. Mm -hmm. All right. Bye, everyone. Thanks for joining the podcast today. Bye-bye. Thank you.